Chapter 18, Mr. Jed. Emily had a warm feeling of pleasure about the request to call. Dawn had always just dropped in, indifferent to her convenience. Cab had only taken her to dances. There was a flattering formality, an indication of a genuine wish to get acquainted about Jed Wakeman's overture. It gratified her. The ungratifying thought occurred that he might be coming just to talk about the Syrians. What makes me have ideas like that? She asked herself. There's a side of my nature that's always trying to pull me down the way Don does. Well, I won't allow it. He asked to call because he likes me and I like him and I'm glad he's coming. She wondered whether it was usual for a girl to serve refreshments on such an occasion. <clears throat> Annette would make fudge, probably, or something in the chafing dish, but she had no chafing dish, and she couldn't bear to think of taking Jed into the kitchen with its old range and oil stove and the wash basin with the roller towel hanging beside it. He does like to eat, though, she remembered. She decided to have freshly baked cookies in the jar and then wait for the inspiration of the moment. Arranging the little parlor on Saturday evening, she felt the familiar qualms, but she suppressed them. She had subscribed to the Atlantic Monthly and to Theater Magazine after seeing them at Miss Fowler's apartment, and now she laid the newest issues on the parlor table. She put music on the piano rack. She shook down the stove and added fresh coals so that the fire would be glowing when Jed came in. Observing these preparations, Grandpa Webster put on a clean collar. He was jubilant about the visit. What's he like, Emmy? Big, I'll bet. Yes, he is. Shoulders like an ox, I'll bet. Yes, he has big shoulders. That's the way wrestlers are built. I've known plenty of them, thrown them too. I'll tell him some stories, he chuckled in anticipation. Emily secretly hoped that he wouldn't tell too many, but she was glad her father was staying up. She liked to have her home be like other girls' homes. If she had a mother and father and a young man called, they would certainly wish to meet him and her grandfather stood in their place. Of course, I'd just as soon he didn't stay up too late, she admitted, smiling into her mirror as she took a last-minute peek. She was wearing the rose-colored dress again, but she had added the big gold earrings that had been her grandmother's. She sat down to wait. At eight o'clock exactly, the old doorbell chimed, and Emily opened the door. The tall, young teacher almost touched the lintel, although his hat was <clears throat> in his hand. He handed Emily a green-wrapped parcel, obviously flowers, and she gave him her slow, shy smile. She introduced him to her grandfather and went to the kitchen. I never had flowers given to me before, she thought, arranging yellow roses in her grandmother's Perry and vase. She carried them into the parlor. Jed was straddling a dining room chair, smiling over the old man's account of Khalil's triumph. Cutest double wrist lock you ever saw. I couldn't have done better myself when I was 20. <coughs> Charlie is a bright boy, said Jed. He stood up when Emily came in and she took her usual rocker. Grandpa Webster talked on with Jed, listening and laughing. Jed seemed to be having a very good time, but Emily began to wish her grandfather would remember that it was past his bedtime. At last, he stood up, <clears throat> shaking Jed's hand warmly. Come to a meeting of the wrestling champs, why don't you? I'd love to, if I may. Jed glanced at Emily. Of course. Come to our Lincoln's birthday meeting. We're going to have flags and a decorated cake, and I'm going to tell them about Abe.
Emmy and I have been studying him all winter, and besides, I feel as though I knew him because I fought in his war. Jed leaned forward. So did my grandfather. He did, by jingo, Grandpa Webster beamed. What was his regiment? I'm ashamed to say I don't know, but he was under Beauregard. Emily's heart sank, but her grandfather rallied gallantly. Those Johnny Rebs were darn good fighters. I met a few at Gettysburg. Tell you what we'll do. He studied Jed from under his bushy brows. Emily saw that he liked the big, gay, self-possessed young man, but she did not dream how much until he completed his sentence. Tell you what we'll do, he repeated, after I've told the champs my side of the Civil War, you can tell them your grandfather's side. And having made this magnificent gesture, Grandpa Webster went to bed. <clears throat> when the door had closed behind him, Jed said, What a soldier! He looked around the softly lamplit room. And what a treasure of a little house. It's more like the homes down south than most of the deep valley homes I've been in. Emily was too astonished to reply. It's so full of old things. Isn't that a Boston rocker you're sitting in? She jumped up. Why, I don't know. It's one of the things my grandmother's family brought from New Hampshire in their covered wagon. I've always loved it. No wonder, he replied. He ran his hand along the landscape of the chair, chair's top rail. I don't believe they made those stencil decorations after 1840. My mother could tell you. She knows all about such things. I've picked up a little from her. If you like old things, said Emily, you must come and see the parlor. He walked around it, smiling tenderly, examining the carving on the sofa and side chairs, pausing before the secretary, lifting the objects in whatnot carefully in his big fingers. He smiled down at wax flowers. These are delightful. My grandmother made them. I've kept everything the way she left it for Grandpa's sake. I've often wished I could bring in some modern things. You could, of course. For myself, I like to mix old and new. But so many houses here have nothing old at all, and a house with nothing old in it seems unseasoned. He gave the parlor a last circling glance. How my mother would love this room. Tell me about your family, Emily said when they were sitting beside the stove again. It's a short story, he replied, because there are only three of us, and we're very good friends. My dad and mother were at special pains to make a friend of me, I suppose, because I didn't have brothers or sisters. We've always had a lot of people around, writers and artists. Dad is a writer and mother an artist, and I was always included in the circle. It accounted, Emily thought, for his self-confidence. She did not think he would be awed by anyone or at a loss in any situation. Where did the wrestling come in? College, he grinned. I can qualify for membership in the wrestling champs. I was a middleweight champion my last two years, urged to go into professional wrestling, but I like sociology better. Now, how about you? First, you're a schoolgirl in a hair ribbon, then a pretty young lady at a dance, and now an earnest student of sociology. Emily laughed, coloring. <laughs> Speaking of sociology, she said, What's the news of our Americanization class? Miss Bangeter likes the idea, not that you've answered my question, and so does Mr. Hunt, 
but it will have to come up before the school board. Oh, dear, exclaimed Emily. What's the matter with that? Mr. Whitlock is president, and he doesn't like Syrians. Don't worry. No reasonable person could object to such classes. I went to see old Mr. Meacham. He's a character, and he'll come to the school board meeting. So will Mr. Sibley, I'm sure. And Miss Cobbs is very much interested. When will it be? The last of the month. I'll keep you informed. They talked about Jed's debating team. It couldn't come up to last year's, he said. They talked about northern winters. Jed liked them, especially the sleigh bells. No one had prepared me for how jolly the sleigh bells are. Have you learned to skate? I'm still bad, but will you go skating some night? I'd like to. They talked so long that Emily went to the kitchen and made cocoa. Jed, following her, continuing to talk. He ate 17 cookies and said they were delicious. Putting on his overcoat, he apologized for the length of his call. Please forgive me. I was having too good a time. How about that skating now? They decided on Wednesday night. He was at the door when he turned and he looked toward the coal stove. Don't stoves like that need coal at night? Why, yes, they do. I'll put it in for you. It isn't necessary, thank you, but I do it all the time. Grandpa had a bad cold at Christmas. He's certainly a soldier, said Jed, walking toward the stove. He picked up the full scuttle, which always stood in readiness, and the coal went rattling in. February, although so short on the calendar, always seemed so long to Emily. Snow kept on falling, although there was so much of it already. She grew tired of shoveling paths, of dumping coal into the heater and taking out ashes. No amount of cream could keep her hands soft, but February this year was nicer than usual. She and Jed went skating often, arms crossed and hands clasped. They glided down the pond, smiling at the stars, drinking in the icy air, enjoying the gay clamor around. Sometimes he appeared after school, wearing his Mackinac, his skates over his shoulders, and she would hurry for her skates and her jacket and fur hat and muff, and they would stay on the pond while the snow put on its twilight gown of blue. One day Jed said, Did you ever read Farrow's Walden? We read some of it in school. I used to love the part about Walden Pond in winter because I'd never seen snow, I suppose. He told about cutting out a chunk of ice and kneeling down to drink and looking into the quiet parlor of the fishes. How nice, cried Emily. It sounds so cozy. On Valentine's Day, the boy from Cook's bookstore brought her a leather-bound copy of Walden on the flyleaf Jed had written. But your parlor is cozier. Before Valentine's Day, he had attended the Lincoln's birthday meeting of the wrestling champs. Judge Hodges attended too. The dining room was brave with flags, the cake was decorated, and Jed brought Grandpa Webster a lithograph of Abraham Lincoln. North and South honored the martyred president in perfect amity. Jed attended all the meetings after that, <clears throat> and with the same assurance, he started calling for Emily after the meetings of the Browning Club. Alice Morrison was teasing, and Miss Fowler's black eyes had the matchmaker's sparkle. Jed's so nice, Emily. The whole high school likes him. When he came, he started calling the women teacher teachers by their first names with that courteous Miss prefixed, of course. Miss Bangeter was startled at first, but now she's Miss Caroline to all of us. He's made us all friendlier. He's such a friendly person. Emily's blue eyes shone in their thickets of lashes. 
Yes, he is, she said. Another dance came along and Cab invited Emily and then Jed invited her and was disappointed when he found out she was going with Cab. He came to the dance alone and took so many dances that Cab, in the midst of the party, shook Emily's hand and mocked farewell. Goodbye, Emily. That's the way it always is. Just when I get me a girl lined up, someone steps in and takes her away. But Emily knew he didn't really mind. She and Cab were just friends, as she had told Aunt Sophie. Jed danced smoothly and serenely. Both tall, they looked well in the mirrors of the Elks Club Hall. She was wearing the white and blue gown, and Jed loved it. You have distinction, Emily, and that fine old jewelry is exactly right for you. Distinction, Emily thought. What a beautiful word. <clears throat> she liked it better than if he had said she was pretty. Peter Pan with the great Maud Adams came to town and there was a rush for tickets. Jed got two in the parquet and they had a very good time for both of them loved the theater. Uncle Chester and Aunt Sophie were there and Emily introduced Jed. The next day, Aunt Sophie telephoned. Your uncle and I thought your young man was charming. I like him myself, Emily said. What's the news from Annette? Oh, parties as usual, mostly with Dawn. She and Dawn are getting awfully thick. To Emily's chagrin, her heart still twisted. But she had hardly thought about Dawn. With Jed adding added to the Browning Club, music and dancing lessons, the wrestling champs and the English class, she was very busy. How do you do it? Jed asked. Oh, Miss Fowler loaned me Arnold Bennett's book, How to Live on 24 Hours a Day. But then, because she really could talk with Jed, she grew serious. I filled my winner up in a sort of desperation. I just couldn't seem to face it that I wasn't going to college. They were having cocoa in front of the coal stove after a skating expedition. Jed looked at her with a puzzled expression. What made you feel so badly about not going to college? I love to learn, but you certainly haven't stopped learning. I'd like to be a really cultured person. Well, you're certainly on the way to be cup to being. And Emily, it's a good thing for the Syrians of Deep Valley that you didn't go to college. Her eyes filled with tears. Jed reached over and patted her hand. He got up. Speaking of Syrians, that board meeting's coming up Friday night. May I call for you? Miss Bangeter has asked me to present our case, but if I run into difficulties, I'll turn to you like Jerry Sib Sibley did before the St. John game.